We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and today we just want to focus on two verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 12 and 13. And I've called this message baptized with one spirit. Baptized with one spirit. So let's read together verses 12 and 13. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. And though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized with one spirit into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now, as you probably remember, the believers in Corinth, that their abuse of spiritual gifts were one of the many reflections of their worldliness and carnality. They were saved, but they were a bunch of worldly Christians. Self was in many ways still too strong in their thinking and Christ Jesus was not topmost and this self-centeredness and this worldliness was also closely related to their divisiveness as well they were very divided and divisive and Paul wanted to set this right so while illustrating the diversity of spiritual gifts, if you look there at verses 4 to 11, uh, like we did before, he repeatedly stressed the one source of all spiritual gifts, the one glorious triune God we serve. He is the one who gives us the gifts as he wills and as he pleases. He also stressed their one purpose and that was to reveal the Holy Spirit's work and power for the common good of the church and obviously also for the glory of Christ and to help us all to attain maturity in the faith so drawing closer to the Lord Jesus Christ and these unifying realities led the apostle to further insight into the unity of the Lord's redeemed community, his bride and his church. Now verses 12 and 13, there Paul explains and illustrates the nature of the unity of the church. And then again in verses 14 to 19, he emphasizes the diversity as a key factor in that unity. And that's surprising you. It's not like we think. It's not like the world thinks either. The surprising thing here is that the diversity of the church is the God-ordained means of bringing fellowship to unity. Church growth movements, even churches, the thing they push is a monocultural kind of a situation and they say that that is good for church growth but everybody is of the same culture and more or less the same but that tends in the direction of uniformity or conformity and that is not the same as unity whereas the church according to the New Testament is unified in its vast diversity where everyone and every gift is vastly different but having said that obviously unless each diverse member of the body accepts his or her part in relation to the whole body diversity will divide rather than unite 
and it will destroy rather than build up and, and it will bring discord rather than harmony and if that diversity is not in check in your own mind and in other people's mind in the church it will result in self-serving rather than in self-giving so today we want to focus on verse 12 where Paul gives an illustration of our unity and then on verse 14 where he explains our unity or the origin of our unity he shows what unites us let's look there at verse 12 believers are unified in one body the body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, diverse parts. And though all its parts are many, they form one body. And so it is with Christ. Now Paul again uses the human body to illustrate the unity and the interrelationship of members of Christ's body, his church. And it's very important, uh, it's a very important analogy for him, a powerful analogy for him, because in this chapter alone, he uses the term body some 16 times. And he uses the metaphor of the human body in many other places in the New Testament, in Romans, in Ephesians, and in Colossians. And this is not surprising because the human body is by far the most amazing organic creation of God. It's marvelously complex, yet completely unified, with unparalleled harmony and interrelatedness. If you are in the medical profession, you will know this. The human body is incredibly complex. And I think in many ways, doctors and clever people are only scratching the surface on finding out how the body really works. And diseases. Yes, we know there's diabetes and there are various theories why we are diabetic. Some people are diabetic and others not. But do they really know what the cause is? Not really, no. Not in the end. We know how to treat it, that's so, and those things, but at the very beginning of that, knowledge is lacking. And it is because the human body is incredibly complex and interrelated. And the point here is that it's a unit. It can't be subdivided into several bodies. It is divided, or if it is divided, the part that is cut off stops working immediately and dies. Isn't that so? You chop off your hand, falls down there, it dies immediately and it is useless. And the rest of the body also immediately loses some of its function and effectiveness. Likewise, Christ's body is also a unit. There are many Christian organizations, you will know in this world, many denominations, agencies and clubs and groups of every kind coffee shops and you name them they there but let me tell you there is only one church and every true believer in Jesus Christ is a member of this church and Paul is so intent on driving home this point of the unity of the church that he refers to Christ as the church and he adds, so it is with Christ. What is he saying? Simply that we can no more separate Christ from his church that we, than we can separate a body from its head. 
And when Christ is referred to as the head of the church, it's always in the sense of mind and spirit and control. And when a body loses its mind and its spirit, it ceases to be a body. It becomes a corpse. It still has structure, but it doesn't have life. It is still organized, but it is no longer a living organism. So we can't exist as a true church without Christ being our head. We would be a corpse as far as spiritual things go. No matter how lively we might seem to each other and to others out there, if Christ is not at the head, if Christ is not in control, we are a corpse as far as spiritual things go. We may be a successful organization, a lucrative business, a lively social club, if you like, even a premium dating service. <laughs> but without Christ, we would not be a church. Jesus used another figure to teach us the same truth. John 15 verse 5. I am the vine. There he is, the plant. You see, going into the ground with its root. You are the branches. If a man remains in me, or a woman, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, says Jesus Christ the head, you can do nothing. It means you can be busy, obviously. You can go to work and you can live your life, but you can do nothing of spiritual value. A severed branch is not only unproductive, it is also lifeless. Now, this is also why the New Testament refers to true believers as being in Christ and also Christ being in us. You see, Jesus Christ is more than simply with his church. He is in his church, and his church is in him. They are completely identified with each other. The church is an organic whole, the living manifestation of Jesus Christ that pulses with the eternal life of God. And the common denominator for all believers is that they possess the very life of God through Jesus Christ. Jesus said in 1 John 5 verse 12, He who has the Son has life. Think of it this way. While he was on earth, Jesus Christ was was incarnate in a single body. We could say he was in human form or in the flesh in a single body. He was present in a single body. And now he is still present in this world in another body. And that body is the great, diverse, precious body that is his church. So Christ is now, in a sense, present and incarnate in a world or in this world through his church and he is visible and tangible to the world out there through us and let me tell you we need to take this to heart there is no true church without Christ life Paul did not say, for me to live is being a Christian. For me to live is being a Baptist, or a Methodist, or a Presbyterian. Or a, I belong to the Gideons, and therefore I live. No, 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 no. Or I am reformed. 
For me to love is being a reformed. No, 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 no. Paul said, but for me to love is Christ. Philippians 1 verse 21. And he could say in Galatians 2 verse 20, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The same Christ life is possessed by every true believer. And every believer, therefore, is a part of Christ, a part of his body, the church. And the church is one body because it is so with Christ. But now, we need to take it a step further. All believers are one because they are baptized with one spirit. Verse 13. Read with me, please. For we were all baptized, and now some translations say by, some say with. Doesn't really matter. For we were all baptized with one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now in this verse, Paul presents two important truths about Christ's body. It's forming and it's indwelling. The forming of Christ's body. The church is formed when believers are baptized by Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit into one body. We were all baptized with one spirit into one body. Very important to understand here. The Holy Spirit is the agent of baptism. And Christ is the baptizer. The Holy Spirit is not the one who baptizes. Christ is the one who baptizes believers into the realm of the Holy Spirit. Remember what John the Baptist said about Jesus when he was baptizing at the Jordan, Jordan River. Matthew 3 verse 11. He said, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Christ is the baptizer. And as Savior, Christ baptist, baptizes with the Holy Spirit and all believers receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And it should be noted, Paul was not referring here to water baptism. Water baptism is an outward physical ordinance believers submit themselves to, and it's also performed by other believers in obedience to the Lord's command. And water baptism plays no part in our conversion. We must understand this. Water baptism can't save anyone. But it is meant to be a testimony to the church and to the world out there of the person who is saved already. Spirit baptism, on the other hand, is completely the work of God. And it is synonymous with salvation. And the word translated here as baptize obviously means to immerse, immerse, immersion, it means that. Uh, but here it refers to immersion with the Holy Spirit. So just like someone can be immersed in water, so a believer is immersed spiritually into the body of Christ through the Holy Spirit. And it should also be said here that the phrase, baptism of the Holy Spirit, is not a right translation of any passage in the New Testament, including this one. And that is because believers are baptized by Christ. And it is best to translate those phrases then as with one spirit. It is not the Holy Spirit's baptism, 
but Christ's baptism with the Holy Spirit that gives us new life and places us into the body when we trust in Jesus Christ. And take note, it is not possible for a Christian, or it's not possible to be a Christian, and not to be baptized by Christ with the Holy Spirit. That's an impossibility. Nor is it possible to have more than one baptism with the Spirit. There's only one Holy Spirit baptism. And the baptism of Christ with the Spirit that all believers receive when they are born again. By this baptism, the Son places all believers into the sphere of the Holy Spirit, into a new environment, a new relationship with others around them, and into a new union with himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's also no mystery here as to the divine roles in our salvation here. The Father sent the Son. The Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit. The Son is the divine Savior, and the Holy Spirit is the divine comforter, comforter and helper and advocate. The Son is the baptizer, and the Holy Spirit is the agent of baptism. And Paul's central point here in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 is that it's this one baptism with the one Spirit that makes the church one body. Think about this for a moment. If there were more than one spirit baptism, there would be more than one church. And Paul's whole point here is that that is not so. In fact, his whole point would be destroyed. He's using the truth of baptism with the spirit to show the unity of all believers in the body. Now we know that many erring teachers today have used a wrong interpretation of baptism with the Holy Spirit to divide off from the body. An imagined spiritual elite who have something more than what the rest has. They are just the old chicken Christians. We are the eagle Christians. We fly. We have the Holy Spirit. We are baptized with the Holy Spirit, they say. But that violates the whole teaching here directly. For we were all baptized. The whole church. And it was a sinful church. Not a spiritual church. Yet they were believers. They were all baptized with one spirit into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks or slave or free. You see? Paul couldn't have stated it more clearly. One spirit baptism establishes one church. And there are no partial Christians. Or no partial members of Christ's body either. The Lord has no halfway houses for his children, no limbo or purgatory. All his children are born into his household and will forever remain in his household. Galatians 3 verses 26 and 27, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For you were all baptized into Christ, having clothed yourselves with Christ. All believers in Jesus Christ become full members of his body, the church, when they are saved. Now it's very interesting that those who advocate that Christians should seek the baptism by the Holy Spirit to experience Christ more fully seem unable to agree on how that should be done. They've got many ideas and many theories, but no biblical method here. 
And the reason is simple. The Bible has no command or suggestion or method for believers to seek to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why not? Because you don't seek or ask for what you have already. True, the believers, if you go there through Acts, remember the believers in Samaria who were converted under Philip's ministry, had to wait a short while to receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit. That was until Peter and John came up to Samaria and laid hands on the converts. Well, that was the first time. And things don't necessarily continue. They happen the first time. No. It was like something new comes into the country, the government declares it in Vintuk, that certain things must happen, and so on. And it happened first in Vintuk. It comes to Wolfers Bay, but maybe not immediately, because we are not right at the center of things. Things may happen a little bit later here. But once it is established, it's established, you see. And there was a reason why this happened to these people as well. Remember the Samaritans, they were despised by the Jewish people. Absolutely. They wouldn't even eat with them. They wouldn't share common vessels. They were outcasts. So the purpose for that ex exception was to demonstrate to the apostles and to bring word back to the Jewish believers that the same Holy Spirit they were baptized with, now came also to the Samaritan believers. Very clearly. Lastly, the indwelling of the body. It's first the formation of the body, is the Spirit's work, the indwelling of the body, is the other aspect Paul touches on here. When we were born again, the Lord not only placed us into his body, he also placed the Holy Spirit in us. At salvation, and that is that moment we were saved, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Speaking of an inward reality. And those of us who trust in Christ are now in the realm of the Spirit, who is also in us. And just as they are, uh, they are no partially saved Christians, they are also no partially indwelt Christians either. The Spirit is not parceled out to us in installments. John 3 verse 34, God gives the Spirit without measure. And just like being baptized with the Spirit is synonymous with conversion, being indwelt by the Spirit is also synonymous with conversion. It is a separate facet of the same glorious transforming act. It's like the other side of the same coin of being saved. Romans 8 verse 9 puts it like this. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. In other words, a person who does not have the Holy Spirit is not a Christian. And he or she who does not have eternal life, that same person, because eternal life is the life of the Holy Spirit. Now, obviously, well-meaning and otherwise sound Christian leaders have caused great confusion and disappointment in the lives of many believers by holding out the prospect of a second work of grace, whatever they may call it. 
time and energy that could have been used, simply used to obey the Lord and to rely on what he has already given is spent striving for something we've already received completely and in abundance. And a person can enjoy, they can't enjoy in fact, what he has if he is forever seeking a non-existent second blessing. And an inadequate doctrine of salvation will always lead to an erroneous doctrine of sanctification. It's a tragedy that those who seek a second blessing of grace can't enjoy it either. They don't enjoy the first blessing, although it is complete, because they are continually looking for the second blessing that doesn't exist. And to be fair, sincere, otherwise biblical evangelicals use this idea to try and invigorate lifeless Christians. And because the church was, was lethargic and carnal and worldly and fruitless, they sought to infuse vitality by encouraging believers to seek an additional work of God, my brother and sister. But the problem has never been the insufficiency or the incompleteness of God's work. In fact, we speak about the sufficiency of Christ and the completeness of his work, that his work is finished on the cross. Christ gives no salvation, but a perfect salvation. And it is tragic that so many are seeking some trium triumphalistic experience, some formalized key to instant spirituality, when the Lord calls for obedience and trust in what he has already given in his perfect work of salvation. Hebrews 10 verse 14 puts it this way, it says, By one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So when you trust in Christ, you are completely immersed into the Spirit and completely indwelt by him. In fact, God has nothing more to put into you. You have it all. He has put his very own self into you. And that can't be improved on. What may be lacking is our full obedience and our full trust and our submission and our full love and our commitment, but not his full salvation or indwelling or blessing. Most definitely not. Remember Ephesians Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Just one verse there. Remember it. What does Paul do? He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Who has, has blessed us, has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. In Christ. I think that sums it up. And it's in Christ. Maybe that's something we miss. We're looking for it in other places, and other stuff we do in ourselves. We want to assert ourselves. We want to enrich ourselves. We want to be at the top. The Bible says God is at the top and you must follow him. It's in Christ, my brother and sister. He is our head. He is our baptizer. He is our indweller through his spirit. And every spiritual blessing possible has been given to sinners who trust in him. Our election is in and through him. Our adoption is in and through him. Our redemption and our forgiveness is in and through him. Our sanctification is in and through him. Eternal life is in and through him alone. And our, our perfect joy and perfect unity is also in him. Our 
growth to maturity is in Him. Our victory over temptation and sin is in and through Him. Our spiritual wisdom and understanding comes through Him. It's all ours in and through Him by His Spirit. Here's the counsel. Let's turn our eyes to Him. That is what the Spirit's work is anyway. He turns our eyes to Christ and He shows Christ to us. More and more and more of Christ. So let's turn our eyes to Him. Let's trust Him. Let's obey Him. Let's love Him. Let's submit to Him. Worship Him. Glorify and praise Him. And live for Him, my brother and sister. Our dear Lord Jesus Christ. Hey. And we have a physical reminder of what He did for us. Is there anyone like Him? Hey. He gave Himself up willingly for us. His body was broken for us. His blood was shed for us. That He may be our head and that we may be united in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior. You want to be blessed? Look to Jesus Christ. Remind yourself of Jesus and His love for you. And you will be blessed beyond measure. Symbols of Christ's body and His blood. His blood was shed for us, for the forgiveness of our sins. His body was broken for us. The wrath of God was turned away from us because of Jesus Christ. He absorbed the wrath of God on the cross. His death is life to us. In His death, the old self dies, but the new self is raised to life with Him through His resurrection from the dead. As you wait, maybe think about your life and where you stand with Jesus Christ. Your commitment to Him, your love for Him, your trust in Him. Maybe you've never trusted in Him for your salvation. Now's the time to come. Maybe you've been disobedient to Him. Now's the time to come and to repent and ask for a cleansing from Him. Maybe you've been in the far country Maybe that heart of love was so devoted to him has grown cold. Now's the time to come to him because he is the source of all blessing. He is the place of all blessing. He's the person of all blessing. And if you are his, you have been baptized by the Spirit. You are in him and he is in you. And surely he will do an amazing thing in your life. Let's eat and drink together. Lord, we don't want to be casual this morning about these things. We're speaking to you, Lord, and you are good. In fact, your goodness is overwhelming. When we remember the cross, we are absolutely speechless at your grace and your mercy to us. Holy Father, that you gave up your most treasured, treasured possession, your Son. For us, we are overwhelmed, Lord. Overwhelmed, Father. 
and Holy Spirit that you came and that through you the Father and the Son indwells us that's absolutely beyond comprehension it is so glorious thank you for putting us in to the sphere of God for opening our eyes to true reality reality that we can see that we can know what the truth is oh thank you so much forgive us our sins cleanse us Lord renew our fervor for you there be any sin that's stopping us from serving you give us the grace of repentance help us to obey and bless our local church I ask for your glory's sake